It is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I, I certainly uh, enjoyed the singing, and, and um, I tell you, God is so good, so thankful for the cross and, and what He did in my life, how He changed my life, and, and how he, he made me a new person. That's something that only God can do, and uh, so, so thankful for that. Be finding in your Bibles, if you would, tonight, uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to be reading the, the first four verses of uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. When you find that, you can stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 1. The message may be long, it may be short, uh, it may be good, it may be not good. All I can guarantee is that it will be a message, and you're getting it. So here we go. Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 4. If you found it, say amen. amen. All right. The screen doesn't count. Some of you are cheating. Okay, it counts. And this is what it says. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Verse 4 says, And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I want to draw your attention to that verse. Let's read that verse again. It came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I titled the message tonight, What's Bothering You? What's Bothering You? You may be seated. Now, we're coming to a place here in the book of Nehemiah just to give a little, a little history. Now, Israel had been carried away captive. They were in Babylonian captivity. They had sinned against God and rebelled against God, and God brought judgment upon them. Uh, their temple was destroyed. Their city, the walls were destroyed. And for 70 years, they were in Babylonian captivity. And now, I want you to remember something here that God never forgot His people. God had never forgotten those ones that were in captivity. And He stirred up the King Cyrus uh, to commission the people to return to the land and to rebuild the temple. So Zerubbabel, he returned and he rebuilt the temple. And then later came Ezra. Uh, and there was a revival of the Word of God under Ezra. And then uh, here, several years after that, is Nehemiah. And we're coming to this place in the book of Nehemiah. This is the beginning of it. And he's more or less giving a narration about the events that happened. And so, as we go through this, I want to point out a few things about Nehemiah that I think are important for us to look at tonight. Uh, now, let's take a look again at verse number 1. Look at the last part of what it says. It says, I was in Shushan, the palace. I was in Shushan, the palace. So uh, the first thing that I want to bring out tonight is that Nehemiah, he looked beyond himself. Nehemiah looked beyond himself. Now, he's in the palace. Now, what was he doing in the palace? Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He would bring the wine to the king. It was actually uh, a high-ranking officer in the court of the king. He, would, uh, he was trusted by the king because his job was to drink the things before the king got it. So if there was any rat poison in it, Nehemiah died before the king. Uh, that was basically, he was the in-between guy. So uh, it's a nerve-wracking job, but nonetheless, it was a prestigious job. Uh, it was high-ranking in the palace. And so here he is in Shushan, the palace. Uh, now, I want to think about, just to get a picture of him in this palace, could you think about the fact that uh, he was probably in pretty decent clothing, his apparel, if he's serving the king, the, the king doesn't want a bum coming up there carrying him a, a dirty glass or something, so he was probably in decent apparel. Uh, he, uh, he probably had all of his needs met. He had a good position there in the palace. Uh, I would say actually that he was probably doing pretty well for himself considering the circumstances. 
uh, he spent his time with the king. And, and actually, it says in chapter 2, we're going to find out later that Nehemiah says, I, I hadn't been sad in the king's presence before. He said, I hadn't been sad there. So, so evidently, he didn't have it bad there. He was a close uh, servant of the king. He had it pretty good, but something happened. Something happened. Uh, he's in the palace, and God has different plans for Nehemiah. You know, sometimes God has different plans for us, amen? Sometimes God has something else that he would prefer to uh, us to do. And so I want you to think about this. God had placed Nehemiah at that place in time and history uh, to do his purpose. Not Nehemiah's purpose, but God's purpose. God had something for him to do. And uh, I want you to know that with that, God has done that for us in this day and time that we live in too. Did you know that we're not here by chance in the hour that we live, in the day that we live in? It's because God has something for every single one of you in this place that God has something, a purpose, and a plan for you in your life. How many believe that tonight? And so Nehemiah, he's in the palace. He says, I, I was in Shushan, the palace. Now listen, in verse 2, there are, it says that uh, some of his brethren came, and, and, he, and so what did he do? He asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Now, uh, it was in this moment that, that something happened. It was in this moment that Nehemiah looked beyond himself. So he's in the palace, and in comes his brethren. And he could have just said, oh, there's those guys, and not cared about it. But it was in that moment, he said, you know what? I wonder how they're doing. He said, I wonder how they're doing. And so he asked them about it. And he took, he took that moment, and in that moment, something happened when he took that initiative to say, what, what's going on out there? He's inside the palace. He's inside the comfort and the walls of this palace. He's there, and he doesn't necessarily know everything that's going on outside of the palace. And here comes his brothers, and in that moment, something changes, something happens, because he decides, I'm going to look beyond my own self. Boy, Sometimes that's hard to do, to look beyond our own selves. But he just asked a simple question. He says, I asked him concerning the Jews that had escaped. Now, I have no doubt that he was aware the temple had been built. Uh, he was probably aware that some of the people had gone back. Uh, but other than that, up to this point, you have to ask, had he taken the time to look beyond himself? Had he taken the time? To look beyond himself up to this point. Are you aware that God has a work going on right now? Are you aware that in Nehemiah's day that God has a work that was going on in that very moment? That God was doing something somewhere with someone. And tonight, in this place, God has a work that's going on. God is doing something somewhere with someone. He's doing something here at this church with some people that have gathered around here tonight because God has a purpose that He wants us to carry out in this world that we live in. God has something that He wants us to do. And I want you to think about that throughout history, God has stirred up different people in different times in different places to accomplish His will. And I want you to know tonight that it is no different today in this hour that we live in God is stirring up people for this day for this hour for this place that we live it's you and I that's the news flash it's you and I we have something to do for the Lord Jesus Christ we have something to do it's to tell others about the wonderful sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross of Calvary it's to tell others that there is a God in heaven who knows who you are who gave his life for you who shed his blood for you and if you come to him in a repentant heart He'll forgive you and change your life forever tonight. Amen. Are you aware that God has a work going on tonight? He does. He has a work going on tonight. Now here's the question. I'm going to ask some questions throughout this message. Are you sitting in the palace? Hmm. Comfy in there, isn't it? We're all guilty. Myself included. Are we sitting in the palace? Not really looking into what's going on outside. Not really taking the time to ask what's really going on out there. Maybe we're even aware of it. 
What are we doing about it? Are we in the palace? We're inside of our walls. We're inside of things and we're not looking outside. But I want you to know that God still has something going on out there. And it's up to us what we're going to do about it. God has never ceased working. God has never, ever ceased working. He sent His Son to die for us. And all those that are willing to, to be stirred up, to come to the work that God has for us, God will put you to work. God will put you to work. You don't have to ask God, use me. It's God, make me usable. God, make me usable. Sometimes we don't make ourselves usable. Amen? Maybe that's just me. I want you to notice something that happened. Nehemiah, he looks beyond himself, and I want you to realize that he discovered a troubling reality. He discovered a troubling reality. Look at verse 3. It says, And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, I don't think this was necessarily the answer that Nehemiah expected. And you'll find out why in the next verse. We'll get there in just a minute. Don't be looking ahead. You guys are cheating. I've seen that. But he found, a discuss he, he found something that was very troubling to him. I, I think that if we really take an honest look, we're going to find some things that are very troubling to us today. And Nehemiah found in his day that the uh, remnant that was there uh, were not doing well. They were in affliction. They were in reproach. And uh, they, the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down. The glory of the city, it was, it was just kind of a rubble. It was kind of a heap. And the glory of the city was, was broken down. And the gates, the entry into the city were burned with fire. So there was no protection of walls. There was, there was no protection around the city. It was, it was heaps and rubble. Sure, there was a temple there. But where was the glory of the city? Where, where was the marker around it that said, this is, this is the city? Where was the glory? Where where was the protection? The gates were open to anything and everything that wanted to come in. They were burned with fire. They were wide open. The walls were broken down. I have to ask you tonight, are God's people living in a reproach and a, in a, a, an affliction like this? It's a hard question to ask. But have the walls come down? Maybe not in this church, but in churches around the world. Have the walls of prayer come down? Have the walls of adherence to the scripture uh, that, that this is the final authority no matter what, the word of God, that this is it? Have those walls come down and anything goes? Whatever you want to say, whatever you want to bring in, it doesn't matter. Have, have a, has even the foundation, the fundamental uh, foundation of, of faith in Jesus Christ alone and, and His grace that saves us, not of works. Have those walls been broken down? The, the faith in Jesus Christ that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Have these things been broken down? And so what does the world see? What did people walking by Jerusalem see? They saw a heap. They saw rubble. They saw people that didn't have it together. They saw people that, that, that didn't know what they were doing. They were out there doing their best, but it wasn't really working. They were a reproach. And you have to ask, is that where many people in the church are today? Is that where many churches at once held to the word of God? Is that where many places at once was strong in the things of God, strong in prayer, strong in their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that where many places have gone? Have we lost our zeal for the Lord? The reality of the day troubled him to his core. Now you can look at verse 4. It says, And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. What he heard wasn't what he expected to hear. Because when he heard it, it broke him. It shook him to his very core. 
When he found the troubling reality, the truth of his day, it shook him to his very core. And he sat down and he wept and he cried and he prayed to the God of heaven and he fasted. And there was a conviction that gripped his soul. He couldn't escape what he heard. Can you see him in that moment? In the palace? Nice clothes. Good job. Good pay. And suddenly he's ashamed as he looks down and sees himself. My people are broken down, afflicted, in reproach. And I'm in king's clothing inside the walls of the palace. And I've not taken the time to look and see what really is going on. It shook him to his core. The reality of our day should shake us to our core. The reality of our day, the compromises of our churches should shake us. Neglect of the word of God should shake us. The lack of prayer, the powerlessness Is there a disconnection that's happened? It should shake us to our core. It should trouble us. It should cause us to seek God. It should cause us to get on our face before God and cry hot tears for the souls of men and women. It should cause us to long for those days when the church was on fire. Where just a few people could turn the world upside down under the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. Should shake us to the core. I want you to notice that the condition of the nation and the people drove him to prayer. I want you to listen as Nehemiah begins to pray. It says in it says the last part of verse four, and, and I prayed before the God of heaven, verse five, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him. And observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive. And thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. Which I pray before thee now. Day and night. For the children of Israel thy servants. And confess the sins of the children of Israel. Which have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah was so burdened. So shaken, so, so, uh, so burdened to his core, it became his consuming passion. And he says, I prayed day and night. Day and night I prayed. And it makes me say, oh God, that you would cause my heart to be shaken to the core like Nehemiah. For my day. Because I believe the same God sits on the throne tonight. And the God that stirred that man up and shook that man and put it in his heart to open his eyes to see what was really going on. That same God is sitting on the throne tonight. And if he can do it for Nehemiah, he can do it for me. He can do it for you. But what are we going to have to do is get on our face and pray before God. Humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due time. That we can go out in the power and the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to get on our face before God we've got to feel God's hurt in our heart oh God that I would see with your eyes oh God that I would think your thoughts oh God that I would feel what you feel in some measure that's what was happening to Nehemiah God loved his people and he still does and he loves all of us And the condition of his nation drove him to pray. Now I want you to look at the at the two things in this prayer. It was a prayer of repentance. A prayer of repentance. Oh, don't say that word. A prayer of repentance. Look at verse six. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. Listen, which I pray before thee now. Day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I 
and my father's house have sinned. Verse 7, we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. I want you to know that he confessed the sins of his nation and his own sins. It is so easy to confess the sins of everybody else. But when it comes to your own sins, you leave those out. His prayer was not just for his nation. It was for his nation. It was God forgive us for the wickedness of this nation. It was God forgive us for what we've done. And it was God forgive me for what I've done. It was a prayer of repentance. The psalmist says in Psalm 139 verse 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. How important that is. It was also a prayer of faith. Praying according to God's word. Look at verses 8 and 9. He says, remember I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses saying. If you transgress I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me. And keep my commandments and do them. Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of heaven. Yet will I gather them from thence. And I will bring them to the place that I have chosen to set my name there. I want you to know tonight there is no firmer foundation that we can pray upon than the word of God. What God's word says. We can stand on that foundation and we can pray. And what, he, what was he saying? He was saying? He was saying, listen, we did evil. And you brought a righteous judgment upon Honest, just as your word said but he said I repent our nation I repent of the sins of our nation and just as you said if we would turn to you and come back that you would forgive us that you would heal us that you would restore us and he was saying oh God just as you did exactly what you said you would do when we sinned against you I'm asking you now to do exactly what you said you would do when we repent and turn to you this was his prayer that he prayed As we conclude his prayer, then I'm going to get into the bulk of the message. Verses 10 and 11, he says, Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. We too are God's people. Are we not? We have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. We have been redeemed by the blood and by God's power. He did what we could not do. He saved us by his grace. And should we not turn to him with our whole hearts. And seek his face. See, Nehemiah, he humbled himself before the mighty hand of God. He humbled himself before God and began to pray and truly seek God. Don't expect, uh, we've, don't expect we can just demand God around and say, do this, do that. It's on God's terms. It's not on our terms. And we've got to humble ourselves. And he was asking for God to do what his word was saying. So it brings me to, uh, to the bulk of the message. What's bothering you? That's the question that came to Nehemiah. Let's look at chapter 2. It came to pass in the month Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Listen, now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very Sore afraid. The king looked at Nehemiah and said, you're not yourself. He looked at Nehemiah and said, what is bothering you? What's wrong with you? You've never been sad before. You've never been broken down before. You've always been happy in my court. Now you're coming to me today with this sad look on your face. And he says, what's bothering you? What's the matter with you? Now listen, the burden that Nehemiah had, listen, it was so heavy on his heart that it showed up on his face 
It found its way into his speech. And eventually it wound up in his hands when he began to work. Isn't that amazing? The burden on his heart was so heavy that he wore it on his face. He couldn't hide it anymore. And he come before the king and the words was already on his lips. It found its way into his speech. He couldn't hide it anymore. And then we find later on, if you read the book of Nehemiah, that it found its way into his hands when he began to work for God. That's what needs to happen to every single one of us. The burden that God would put on us, our heart would be so, so grievous that we, that we couldn't stand to see the souls of men and women going to hell, that, that there would be a burden so deep in our hearts that it wouldn't be something that we just, uh, that we just casually do, but it would, be a, it would be something that you could see, that they could see the compassion in your face, that they could see the hurt in your face for them, the love in your face for them, and it would begin to come out in your words when you begin to tell them about the goodness of Jesus Christ and the mighty wonders that he's done in your own life and that's when it begins to come out in your hands because you know what you're becoming the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ amen you begin to walk out and say listen I've got news the Lord Jesus Christ can change your life he's in my heart and I got a burden for you because I love you and I don't want to see you go to hell and I've got some words that I need to speak to you and they're not easy words but I'm going to say them anyway those are the things that need to be in our heart and they will manifest into our hands and our feet. Amen. He had a good reason to be troubled. When the king asked him that, he had a good reason to be troubled. And he says, in verse 3, he said unto the king, let the king live forever. Don't kill me, king. Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Now, think about this. What's bothering you? That's the question that that the king asked Nehemiah. What's bothering you? The right things were bothering him. The right things were bothering him. You know, you can get bothered by anything. The smallest things, I used to, I was, I was homeschooled and I used to sit there. Mom would be, quit, stop doing that. Next thing I know, I'm, I always got a rhythm pumping inside, you know. And I, you know, would be doing my schoolwork and it, it would drive people crazy. Just a little thing like tapping. Anything can drive you crazy. Anything. And Nehemiah was bothered. But he wasn't bothered by something that didn't even really matter. He was bothered by something that really mattered. And so you have to ask the question tonight, what's bothering you? And the king asked Nehemiah, he said, what's bothering you? And he said, listen, the city is broke down. The walls are broke down. My people are not doing good. Everything's in a mess. And I've got this burden that's so, so heavy on my heart that I can't stand it. I've got to do something. King, I've got to do something. Would you, would you let me do something about this? There was the burden in his heart. He wasn't content any longer to do nothing. Nehemiah was no longer content to sit in the palace and do nothing. He could not stand it any longer. It was a fire in his bones. He could not forbear. He had to do something about it. And so he says, listen to what the king says in verses 4 and 5. And then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make a request? And Nehemiah says, I thought you would never ask. That's my paraphrase. So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. Nehemiah could no longer hold back. And he said, Listen, send me. He said, send me. Have we heard that throughout the pages of Scripture before? Send me. Send me. Send me. There's a need. Send me. Send me. And Nehemiah says, send me to go and build this city. 
He had something that he had to do. He couldn't, he couldn't bear it anymore. This was in his heart to do. This is what he had to do. He wasn't, he wasn't asking uh, for the king to send him as, as the priest or some great big shot or anything like that. He just said, I simply want to go and build the city. Send me. Just let me go and build. I don't need anything fancy. I just want to go and build. And whoever will come with me. He just wanted to go. He wanted to go. My question to you, I, and, and I believe that the burden in his heart was so, was so strong that even if no one else would go with him, we know that they did. We know that people went with him and God sent people with him. The king sent people with him. But I believe that even if no one else would go, that Nehemiah, if the king let him, would have found himself down on that wall with a trowel, putting some rocks on, stacking them up, singing, don't none go with me, <laughs> still I'll follow, you know. He was building, he would have went, he would have went even if nobody went. His heart was in the work, his heart was in the work. Now we're coming towards, uh, we're nearing the end of the message. You were all wondering that, I'm just answering the question in your mind. I want you to know that God opened the door for Nehemiah. How many would agree that God opened the door? God opened the door. He's the one that opens and no man can shut. He's the one that shuts and no man can open. You know, the Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. The kings think they got it under control, but they ain't got nothing. It's in God's hand. They think they know what they're doing, but ultimately God is the one that has that. And what's amazing is that God provided. God opened the door. God made a way. He did it for them. He granted the request. The king granted the request. He sent letters of authority. He gave them the supplies to build. And listen, he even sent captains of the army and horsemen to go with him. He said, you know what, Nehemiah, I'm just going to give you everything you want. And... Whatever else you need to build a wall, whatever you need, you've got it. That's God. That's God. That was an impossible barrier for him to overcome, and God opened that door. God brought it to pass. God provided. Now, I love this part. Nehemiah, and I'm not going to read that portion of the scripture, but in verses 11 to 16, he goes out and he personally surveys the damages. He goes out and looks. He doesn't tell anybody necessarily what he's doing. He goes out and he surveys to see all the damages. He goes and looks at each gate. He goes and sees the wall for himself. He, With his own eyes, he looks to see what they said is true. And he finds out it's exactly as they said. And probably when he seen it, he said, this is worse than they even told me. And he went out and looked by night. And, uh, and it says that the, he seen the gates and all the different things that were done. And, he, and it just further fueled the passion in his heart it further fueled the passion inside of him and I want to say to you tonight the preachers around the world that are preaching the gospel they tell you about how dark it is outside they tell you about how bad it is and, and it's as dark as they said it is and more and uh, if you go out and take a look for yourself you need to go look with your own eyes and see the world lost in sin you need to go look with your own eyes and get out of the walls of your palace get out of that place where you're shut off from everyone else you're hiding in a hole get out of that place go and look you hear the message go and look and get a burden in your heart and get a passion in your heart and know this that God will open the door when God's sending you God's going to open the door but it's got to be a, someone that's willing to go someone that's willing to not turn a blind eye and look away he went out and looked and I love this in verse 17 and 18, then said I unto them, he makes a plea to the people. He's seen it for himself. He's got all the authority from the king. He's got everything that he needs. God has put it all into place. He's got a burden in his heart. He's got a passion in his heart. There is a fire inside of his heart and inside of his bones. And he's got the blessing of God to proceed. And he stands before the people and he makes a plea to the people. Listen to what he says. Verse 17, Nehemiah chapter 2. Then said I unto them, you see the distress that we are in. 
how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. Amen. As also the king's words that he had spoken unto me, and they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Isn't that amazing? God stirred this man. God put a fire inside of him. God opened his eyes. He opened the doors. He sent him out there. He gave him the ability. He gave him a purpose to do this great work. And now he stands before the people with an earnest plea. Not half-hearted, but whole-hearted. We've seen that in the scriptures, have we not? We've seen his heart for this work. We've seen his desire to do this work. We've seen that it is burning inside of him. He is not slacked. He's not been lazy concerning this task. But he is holy and completely sought the Lord. He has done everything that he could do. And he stands before the people and he makes a plea with them and says, We've got to do this. We've got to do this. We've got to do this. And he makes a plea to them. And I love the people answer. And they said, let us rise up and build. In verse 18, and they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nehemiah knew he couldn't do it alone. He made that plea. He said, people, you see it. You're living in it. You know what it's like. You're here. You see the reproach. The good hand of God is on us to move. Let's move. Amen? You see that? You see that? The good hand of God is on them. You know, they faced opposition right and left. Throughout, the, if you read Nehemiah, they faced opposition right and left. Every, every time God raises up to do a work, there's always a devil raising up somebody to fight against the work. It can come from without, it can come from within. In, his, in, this, in Nehemiah, it comes from all the places that it could come. There's always someone standing up to oppose the work of God. And they faced that opposition. But no matter what opposition came along, they kept doing the work. At one point, it was so bad that they kept a weapon in one hand and they kept their tools in the other hand. They were working and they were on guard the entire time. That's how bad it got at one point. They were on the lookout. They had a, a shovel in one hand and, and a Uzi in the other. It's like 100 rocks per second, those things shoot. So what, so what does this mean for us? What, is this, what does this mean for us? I think that God had raised up Nehemiah for that day and that hour and that purpose. And those people got behind the man of God that God had called. And I think in every church that it would do the people well to get behind the man of God. That God has placed in that body. To not be those that would fight from within. But with one accord. As God leads the man of God. We'll rise and build. As God lays it on their heart. As God burdens that man of God. As God puts a burden in the heart. And it comes out. On his face and in his speech. And in his hands. And the plea comes out to congregations all over the place. All around the world. Where God raises up his men. The congregations need to stand up and say. Yes, we will rise and build. It is the day to press forward. It is the day to move forward. Because time is short. Time is short. Jesus is coming back soon. We don't have much time to do this. We've got to be urgent about what we're doing. The Apostle Paul said it is high time that we awake out of our sleep. It's time that we move. It's time that we work. Because the Lord could come back tonight. There are millions of souls perished right now as we're in this congregation who are going into the fires of hell and I have to ask you tonight does it bother you? Does it bother you? I pray to God that it will bother me more. I pray to God it will bother me more. And so I ask you directly as we come to the conclusion of the message I ask you directly the same question that the king asked Nehemiah, what is bothering you? 
Everybody's got a problem in here. I hope it's not with me. <laughs> we have a wonderful church here. God has blessed this body of believers. Such an amazing group of people here. And I love you all. The question is, what is bothering you? What is bothering you? We need to be bothered by the right things. We need to be bothered by the right things. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Do you ever look beyond yourself? Do you ever look beyond yourself? Or are you self-consumed? Do you ever take a moment to see what's going on in your brother or your sister's life? Do you ever look beyond yourself? We live in the most exciting time in the history of all of mankind. When the Lord Jesus could come back. We need to be looking what is bothering us. In this late hour, what is bothering us? The question I would ask next is, do you only look beyond yourself to point out the faults of other people? Do you only ever look past yourself because, oh, can you believe what they did? Can you believe what that person did? Ha, they wouldn't act that way if they really loved the Lord. They would do things differently if they were really right with God. That's looking beyond yourself for the wrong reasons. If you only ever look beyond yourself to point out faults of other people, you need to get right with God. And don't ever expect that God will use you as long as you're critical of your brothers and sisters. Jesus gave a parable about that. When he forgave, a, uh, he, he talks about the one that forgave the great debt. Incredible debt. And then that person goes out and finds somebody that owes him just a little bit. And he grabbed him by the throat and he threw him in prison. Till he paid it all. And Jesus says, the one that forgave the big debt said, you wicked servant. I forgave you of all of that. And now you throw your brother in prison for just a little. That ought to answer us how God feels about that sort of thing. Did Jesus forgive you of your sins? Did Jesus wash you clean? Did you have a debt that was so astronomical beyond your debt, beyond your ability to ever pay it? And Jesus Christ paid it? Then who am I to find my brother or find my sister and grab him by the throat and say, You offended me. You owe me. Pay your debt. We need to release some debts. Every one of us need to release some debts. Because Christ forgave us, we ought to forgive our brothers and sisters. Amen. It's clear how God feels about that. We don't need to fix our eyes on people's faults. These people that joined together to build the wall, they were in unison together. They, they got with it. They started working. They were, you look, if you read the book of Nehemiah, you find they got with it. They got busy. They were doing what they needed to do. They weren't fighting with one another. There was a few of the nobles that it says in, over in chapter 3 that they didn't put their necks to the work of the Lord. It was, I guess, below them to do. That's uh, chapter 3, verse 5. And so in conclusion of the message, as she's coming to bring the song tonight, here's what we need to do. We've got to look beyond ourselves for the right reasons. We've got to take an honest look at the world that we live in. We've got to pray and seek God in humble repentance and faith. We've got to ask God to burden our hearts with a passion, a consuming passion. And then we've got to not stop there. We've got to rise and build. Find your place along the wall. Not push somebody out of the place. That's where I want to work. Find a place along the wall. If there's something broken down, that's a place for you. There are millions 
that are lost and they're passing away tonight. The very last thing that I want to say is that the people out there, they're hateful. The people out there, they're vulgar and they're violent. They're immoral and they're full of wickedness and yet Jesus died for them. And as I was praying about this very message, the scripture came to mind in Matthew 24, 12. And Jesus said this, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Oh, we can get so fed up with this world and our love begins to die. And we can be bothered by the wrong things and bothered by all the things they're doing. And all the while, our love and us, the messengers, are asleep on the job. I want the love of God burning in my heart. How about you? Go ahead and stand with me tonight. We're going to give uh, an invitation if you'd like to pray. And as she begins uh, to sing, I, I want to have prayer with all of us after she sings a few courses of the song. But these altars are open for you tonight if you'd like to pray. We if you have a praise need. the old God for the sun.